Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Men With Purpose. We're trying to have impactful conversations with really conscious men's uh, facilitators and men in general to talk about uh, things that are really important, to contribute pert pertaining specifically around masculinity, the state of masculinity today. Really try to have uh, impactful and conscious conversations about what is it like to be a man today, what is masculinity, and really pushing the whole narrative of men's work, if you will, uh, a little bit more into the conscious awareness of the mainstream. Uh, today I'm joined by Rafia Morgan, and Rafia has been leading, you know, le uh, spiritual therapy groups for, and been involved in the whole personal development space for 40 plus years now. He's trained in various modalities and uh, including uh, he spent a lot of time actually with his uh, one of the spiritual uh, spiritual teachers in Indian mystics Osho, where he traveled the world and you know worked uh, alongside of him and yeah I'm, I'm incredibly uh, excited and grateful to have Rafia on the channel so Rafia thank you very much for joining thank you Paolo it's a pleasure to be here and to feel your enthusiasm for this work and your willingness to, you know, to engage people and draw people in to hopefully look at important questions. Yes, sir. Indeed. So I, I did tell you before the actual we started the recording, I could probably spend another five minutes or so talking about your experience and accolades and, and all of that. Uh, perhaps Tell for people that are tuning in right now and don't know much about your work and your background, can you tell us a little bit about how you got on this personal journey uh, yourself? Ooh, that's a long story. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> tell my life. That's a big I question. Have, I have to tell my life story, but um, I think I started in my teens having a certain inclination towards feeling something spiritual. Although I went to school, university in Berkeley at the time when it was really a kind of revolutionary center and all that energy was going into trying to change the world. And, and um, it, was, it was fun, it was deep, it was relevant, but it was also a lot of blame in it. And because I felt that we, you know, we were fighting against the corruption of the system and they were wrong and we were right. And mm. I had an experience at one point where I just really went inside and I felt like, well, what needs transformation is me. And then I'll be capable to come out and say something to the world. But I'm just an, you know, an angry, guilty, white, middle class kid, basically, at that point joining with a lot of other people and pretending to have answers hmm. and I don't. So that, that opened up more of the spiritual side and the starting to move more into meditation and looking at other things. And then I had a very strong personal crisis, which was the end of a significant relationship with a woman that broke my heart and where mm. I felt very betrayed and I felt unable to really deal with the, the avalanche of feelings and stuff mm. that were coming up and and it was driving me a bit mad in fact I just couldn't find my place mm. you know and so I felt in a big hole I felt in a big deficiency and by whatever grace or intelligence of my own or something, I found, uh, I saw a little sign that advertised a men's group. Wow. And it appealed to me. And so I just called the number up and, and decided to go. And that was my first group experience. It was a men's encounter group in Berkeley in the old days. So it was like, and so I walked into this house and introduced myself and told my story. And about 15 minutes later, they had me out in the middle of the room and pushing me to get into my energy and get into my anger and, and put out what I was really feeling. And I, and I was able to, 
Wow. And there was like this huge wave that had just been held back because I just didn't know how to deal with it. I wasn't really in touch with my feelings. I wasn't really able to express myself. Mm -hmm. And I had so much pent up anger and frustration inside of myself from the end of this relationship and the betrayal. And, and then, of course, many other things in my life mm -hmm. where I just hadn't been adequately, adequately taught or trained to be expressive of my feelings it was like mm. hold them back hold them back and i can remember walking out of that group and it was many many years ago in the 70s um just like it was yesterday feeling like oh my god my life just changed <laughs> and it was in the presence of men and it was bringing out my emotions and i just felt this surge of life force enthusiasm that had been bottled up flood my whole system and it, it was also coincidentally a bioenergetics group we did bioenergetics in it, which i know you're familiar with yes you know, so that gets energy moving and i started on a journey of really exploring emotional work and and meditation. I even was mm -hmm. working with uh, a Thai meditation teacher at one point named Dhiravamsa, who was interested in sitting. We sat very long hours and doing bioenergetics. Mm. Wow. And so we would do this very strong, expressive things, and then we would come back and then we would sit. And so I started to integrate you know and start to feel an embodiment where before that i felt i was more like a floating head mm -hmm. you know and i started to really come into my body and the enjoyment the fulfillment and the engagement with life just started to really take off after that wow. and, and, and and then i came together with a group of other men and we formed a men's house when we were all very seriously into looking at ourselves and sharing with each other and it was largely in response to the women's movement which mm -hmm. was berkeley was kind of a center point of that and rather than react against it we thought "Ooh, there's some serious questions to look at here mm -hmm. what are women so pissed off about with us men what are they saying? What is this objectification thing? What is this? And then, you, and then it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to look at the situations that we grew up in and see how discriminated against women were in terms mm. of job inequality and all kinds of things. And they were very strongly gathered there and they were really in our face. And so we started really looking at, well, who are we with men as men? And um, we even had a, a, an agreement amongst us that we were available to each other 24-7 to do something called co-counseling, which was a technique where you didn't have to be a counselor or a therapist, but you could facilitate somebody to work through their things. And we mm -hmm. used to use it. We go wake each other up sometimes in the middle of the night. <laughs> it was radical days, you know, it was a radical wow. experiment, you know. And and we even had a radio show on the local KPFM um, on men's work. So we were probably really out at the cutting edge of what was happening in America. Mm, mm. And I stayed with it, but at a certain point. I started, I, was, I remember I was in one meeting of my men's collective, as we called it, and um, I had this kind of vision of all of us sitting around castrating ourselves. Hmm. In, in what sense? Cutting off our balls. Um, it just, it, as an as a image, because of guilt, white, middle class guilt, Mm. And instead of really embodying the masculine, we were kind of trying to compensate for all the sins. And we were becoming kind of wimpy pleasers also. And we were getting very involved in our minds. And I remember mm. in that moment, I thought, oh, this is not the way either. 
you know, and I realized I wasn't even pursuing women that I was attracted to during that time because I was so afraid that I was objectifying them and et cetera, et cetera. Wow. So I, I remember it, by the end of the meeting, I just stood up and I resigned and I turned more towards the inner world and more towards my inner work and less towards social activism which then has led me on a long journey of doing men's groups, leading men's groups, getting familiar with different traditions and paths, and in my own sense of myself, coming to a, a more full embodiment of, of being a man. And, wow. it's, and, and it's a never ending curve. It's of a big course. Curve. Mm, mm. And may it always be. Of course. Yeah. You know, may it always be. I know. I, I can, I can so much re relate to what you're saying and everything you've said, we can probably have a conversation just for the last two, for the next two, three hours without preparation, just on that. Cause you've said so much, um, couple of questions. How old are you at the time when all of this is happening? You're in this kind of right, in the, the middle of the, the men's movement and, you know, women kind of rebelling against the, the patriarchy, you could say, how, how old were you at the time? Probably 23, 24, wow. something like that. Okay. So you go, you create this uh, men's collective house. Yes. And you go through all these bunch of techniques and you go through all of these practices, the radical honesty, the being able to hold space for other men at, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and then something shifted for you. Did you came to that realization on your own or, what, or was that shared amongst the other members of the house? Or was this like, okay, you know what, I'm actually resigning from all of this. I'm just going to pursue more the inner, inner parts of myself. No, it was more my own movement. I continued to live in the house, mm. you know, and it was a pretty radical leftist political oriented house. And, and they were, I, the guys were my friends. I loved them. But I was in my room meditating when mm. they were out more talking about okay. you know, the kind okay. of political edge. And in the end, after a year or so of that, in very good relation with everybody, I moved into a little cottage by myself because mm -hmm. I felt, I just felt the need to be, to devote my time towards my inner work. And I started becoming very passionate about meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I was more interested in spiritual evolution than I was in, um, focusing specifically on men's work mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that took me on a whole journey, which took me to India and got me into the Osho community and etc. Mm -hmm. um, where I was at a certain point asked by Osho to lead groups. And wow. I, started, I started leading groups, um, not specifically related to men, but um, and I got very much into bioenergetics at that time mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. body work and a lot of emotional expression. And, yes. and I felt myself very much a man at that point. And, very, and, and, and I started to just recognize this sense of power and groundedness and the response I was getting from the community and from women and from mm. other guys was confirming that as well. Mm -hmm. And I started to study Jungian psychology and I started getting into Jung's understanding of anima and animus and the yes. balance of the inner man and inner woman and how does that work in women, how does that work in men. And I created, you know, groups around that for some period of time. And in short, because that's a complex piece of psychology, yeah. it, it came down to me to men being grounded and present and embodied in themselves as men. Mm -hmm. And then very naturally, they would be able to deal with and integrate their inner feminine side, as well as relate to 
the outer feminine in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. And a, a sort of reverse for the women, really landing in the feminine, which is a whole nother piece, which, yes. you know, I could talk about a lot, but it's not the, the point of our talk right now. But a lot of work came out of that. And then out of that, I started leading men's groups um, as well. And it was just really to help men to become embodied and to show up and Along around that time, I became really also aware of a cultural deficiency mm. that we just were not initiated. You know, mm. like the lack of a rite of passage and welcoming yes. into the yes. masculine, and how lost we were, and how mm. dysfunctional we were, and how afraid men mm. were, and how. Um, castrated we were also from the mm -hmm. from the point of view of not having really received the support from a previous generation or our fathers or elders who helped us feel relaxed and confident about mm -hmm. ourselves as men and so the point of that was just to to, to help men to get so embodied and grounded in themselves mm -hmm. and to be able to really love the truth and be willing to share the truth of their feelings, their values, their needs, and their vision and risk the rejection and anger of women mm -hmm. and other men and the world at large by being true. And wow. that's a whole process. That's yeah. a whole process to even find out what do I want, you know? You know, and who am I actually, and what do I feel, and getting a clear connection to that, and then developing a relationship to telling the truth is also a whole process because... These are very big questions and very big, big very topics. Big, very, yeah. very big topics, you know. And mm. do, do I really love the truth or do I, do I love to lie or am I a pleaser? Mm -hmm. And what I found so many of us men had fallen into was a certain sensitivity to women where we were always trying to please them rather than telling the truth, which put put us back into the castrated little boy basically trying to make mm. mommy happy. And there's nothing that I think women hate more than that than a pleasing man. They want the man to show up. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> blown away. Okay, this is like, okay, years of experience talking and actually practicing and embodying this work. Um, to, 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 Put a little bit of context or a little bit of background, perhaps. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this castration of the masculine and, like you said, the being a people pleaser, being a so-called nice guy um, syndrome? What, where does that come from? And also, what more importantly, what could men do about it right now? Yeah. I mean, I think to make it simple, most of us missed feeling the real support of our fathers because our fathers didn't have it, mm. you know? And, and, and what I, the opposite of castration is to be grounded, relaxed and confident that I have what it takes inside of me to meet the challenges of my life. And I don't have mm. to effort or prove or I mean, there's effort involved, but I, I don't have to try to pretend to be something that I'm not. And that's the process of the inner work is to land in there and, and develop and find that inner support inside. And in order to do that, one has to face that one didn't receive it and to see how that's formed in the personality. And it has quite a lot to do with the relationship with the father a lot of times and then also the rite of passage and that was missing but one of the things that i find is really really true is that when men come together with the firm intention and purpose to find themselves and to connect with their masculinity this thing called male bonding really does happen 
and it in itself is a great healing. You know, it's like a relaxation happens. It's something that's been missing. And I find men very generous in giving that when they, when they come into that authenticity in a men's space. And it's just like, it, it just, that in itself heals a lot and gives men hope that I can, oh, I can be myself. And um, I've forgotten your question right now exactly. I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking about castration. You know, it's like healing, healing castration mm. you know, happens a lot by doing that. And then also having embodiment practices and, and continuing to do the work around taking the risk to share your feelings and to be mm. true, to share your values and your needs mm -hmm. without manipulating mm -hmm. and risking that other people don't understand or will get angry or will leave you but by telling the truth. And that brings yeah. a certain dignity, you know? And so there's somebody there and we make mistakes and we sometimes our worst expectations are realized Hmm. often quite a lot, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and yet there's a certain place inside that feels like, okay, at least I went for it. At least mm. I tried to tell the mm. truth. And something builds. And that, that which builds becomes like the foundation of a, a, you know, a man who's present and a man who's healed to some degree mm. or to a great degree a castration wound. Mm -hmm. Which and the castration wound basically makes us feel inadequate, and the feeling is literally, I don't have what it takes. I'm mm -hmm. not going to make it, mm -hmm. you know. And so then we go to our minds and we try to figure out how to do it, and we perform. We could become performers, you know. So the whole performer, you know, archetype becomes really a big thing to look at. You know, mm -hmm. how am I performing? being a man and I think women are really sensitive to these things also is there very sensitive is there really a man here that makes me feel relaxed or do mm. I feel like I got another fucking guy here who's talking bullshit and doing yeah. this whole thing and or trying to please me or something and and they close off mm. yeah or yeah am I being here with a man child which means I need to become more masculine to kind of be able to exactly. okay, it's, it's all polarity okay understood exactly the woman goes into her male side it's like fuck this guy he's not he's yeah, not yeah. there and and the guy gets more scared and you know the story mm -hmm. then becomes very yeah complicated. wow so yeah so <laughs> it's like showing up you know and, and yes you have to do that work Mm. to learn how to show up, you know, mm. and to do it in the presence of, of other men to get that kind of support. So like the the groups, some of the groups I'm sure you've done, you've probably experienced them as, as kinds of rites of passage where you come Indeed. through and you look around at the other men and you you don't see competitors, you don't see better and worse, you see brothers. Indeed, you feel and you feel loved, and you mm. feel, you know, these guys have got your back, you've got their back, and they're, they're something that men can move into quite easily and fluently mm. with the right context mm. and the right kind of holding, you know, by the people who are leading it and organizing it. Mm. I mean, we've never spoken before, for the most part, as you were answering the question, you're like <laughs> explaining my background and how I felt for a majority, a big chunk of my, my life because of exactly that. It's a cross generational thing. It's cross generational wounds that, you know, my father probably gave to me, his father gave to him or in the, in the sense that the, the, you know, the ritual initiations, the whole notion of liminality and all these kind of things weren't present there and hence hence why we've arrived here um i've listened to i've listened to one of your interviews and and, and you use the term dickhead <laughs> meaning that you know the <laughs> the perf i mean sorry for, for lack of better word but uh oh, I, it's a great expression i love it yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and but but you you put a very different spin on it which i thought wow this actually makes sense right if you are um enabled to perform you kind of put this kind of dickhead in your brain maybe i'm kind of um 
slaughtering a little bit of what you said or regurgitating what you said, but you're trying to perform what you had, right? Being too much stuck in, in the brain, not actually into the body, embodying those qualities of relaxation and breath and, you know, it's going to be okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's different compensations for being castrated and feeling castrated. One is to become a pleaser and a real nice guy. Another compensation is to become very macho. I find macho, you know, like really, uh, you know, putting out a big thing and it's just like, uh, that's not it. No. And then some people feel like I got nothing downstairs. So they try and put on a big one upstairs. Exactly. And they want to <laughs> penetrate the world with their heads. And you can kind of see that rigidity in the neck and the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I felt, and, and it's a dickhead, you know. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are all compensations and they're to be met. It's kind of funny right now, and it can sound like putting down, but these are really were intelligent strategies by people to survive mm. in environments mm. that mm. they were in as their personality was forming. So yes. there wasn't that support. And so just like me and just like you, you learn the strategy to be able to succeed and so maybe you become a dickhead or maybe you become a macho or maybe you become mm -hmm, a pleaser mm -hmm. or a mix of all of them and and so i try and be there really with a lot of you know humor is great yeah and compassion is a must because people grew up in the environments they grew up in and they managed to survive and they managed now to come to a place let's say, where they're ready to look at mm. themselves. And so I try and take any judgment out. At the same time, I try to make them aware of the pattern of behavior they've developed mm -hmm. to compensate for what was missed or lost or disembodied mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what, what I wanted to also add to that is that a humor could be incredibly valuable too in the sense of being able to facilitate a, a sacred space like that but also when we when we kind of throw these terms in prior to this interview and actually hearing you use that term i thought dickhead is it just used the derogatory term but now when you put that spin on things to the actual word it i'm saying it uh, with a lot of compassion as you said coming from a place of you know this is just the pattern we need to Put a little bit of light on what you're actually doing that you know yeah. body wise and thinking patterns etc etc and to show you that well this, maybe there's another way to do this rather than just like slamming uh in a wall with your head every single time <laughs> <laughs> well I, the, I i i kind of discovered something about it once where i was i was in denmark and i was preparing to lead a group and i was in a group meditation prior to the group and I was just sitting there and I was just rehearsing, 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 rehearsing in my brain. I couldn't shut it off and and I finally I I inquired with myself, what what's going on with me? Why am I so in my head? And then I realized, oh I'm actually scared about leading the group. And then I went down and I felt my belly and there was a big knot of anxiety in my solar plexus. Mm. And then I realized, okay, what is that? And then it was like, oh, it's performance anxiety. Mm. And what is performance anxiety? It's the anxiety that's there when you feel like you don't have what it takes to do the job. And so the moment I became, and, and, and then that generates a whole performing production. And the moment I, I felt that and I recognized what was happening inside of me, I could, what I did actually was really interesting is I, I, I just <laughs> offered a kind of prayer to my long dead father who had never led a group in his life. And I just said, Dad, I need your help. I, wow. I'm, really, I'm really scared about leading this group. I don't know. I, I, and, I'm, and I need your help. It, I, I knew he couldn't help me. 
he didn't know anything about leading groups and I didn't really expect him to, but it was a kind of surrender rather than getting more and more tense and thinking about it. I went to that place, actually, I need help. And it relaxed me. Wow. And the anxiety went out of my belly. And then I sat there and I felt very grounded. And then I felt really loose about going to the group. And I didn't think about it again. I just went in and did it, you know, and it just wow. came out, you know. So that was, uh, that was really a real turning point for me with starting to pay attention to anxiety mm -hmm. and trying to always notice it when it was there, when it's there, mm -hmm. and to have a relationship to it mm -hmm. as, as an opportunity to learn something rather mm -hmm. than something to be avoided at all costs. Because mm. Anxiety feels terrible, let's face it. Oh, yeah. I, I can relate for sure. For sure. Everybody can. I think, yeah, everybody can. Uh, maybe they don't label it as anxiety per se, but it is this kind of nagging feeling, like you said, in the solar plexus that I'm sure mo most of us has felt and have, have been feeling for a long time. Is this technique, is this a technique that you've developed or is just, you know, you just said, you know what, I'm just going to surrender to whatever I'm feeling right now and maybe seek health or uh, say a prayer or something. Is this something that came consciously to you or? It's a little bit of both, but it, it also came out of my study that I was doing with the, what's called um, the diamond essence work, which mm. comes out of work by A.H. Almas and a man named Faisal Mukadam, and I studied that work for some year and a big part of years and a big part of that had to do with grounding mm. and and that has a lot to do with support and it has a lot to do with relaxation and in that I recognized that there was some missing support from my father and there was still a part of me that was still like a child, still wanting that support from him. And so rather than just go into that, uh, he's never going to give it to me, I got to do it myself, there, there's an understanding in that work that you actually can ask your father and that's the association or the remembrance that I had that mm -hmm. caused me to do that. And it instantly worked. Wow. Now that's a bigger piece of work than what I'm boiling it down to right of now. It takes, it takes quite a bit of inquiry um, and checking out the relationship with father. But I think for men, that is in general, a mm. pretty important place to look. And as you said, transgenerational things, mm, mm. you know, patterns and traumas and all these things can mm -hmm. easily get passed down father to son. And yes. So it is an important piece of work, mm -hmm. I think, in most men's groups to do some work on the relationship with the father and allow the feelings to come up about it, and mm. hopefully to heal something on that so that um some of what you might call that false will i'm gonna make it yeah you know, relax a little bit because that is also the dickhead the macho mm. yeah. yeah okay yeah i i, I mean th these these words are resonating uh and hitting home for me um you know ever since i kind of started on this personal development journey about eight years ago I, i've speaking to a lot of men uh particularly i find that at least maybe this is just my experience so far but the the father-son relationship is probably the most wounded relationship doesn't really get talked enough about i think probably because again men are kind of closing in on on emotions and sharing those emotions and that being passed over to to the boy and the boy kind of projects the same thing and it just becomes like a a, a downward uh, spiral so to speak. Yeah. Is, is that kind of your experience as well? Well, I think in general, <laughs> yes, it isn't investigated nearly deeply enough. And there's not enough men who are really doing the work. Mm. 
in most of the groups that I run that are open to men and women, I would say it's about 65% women who come and 35% men. So again, that question arises, as it arises a lot of times for women, where are the men? You know, and I think we're quite defended around a lot of these things. And a lot of men are quite lost with regard to that. So I'm very much encouraging and supporting men to look into their relationships with their fathers. Um, when I do individual work, when I do group work, I get it in there somewhere at some point. And also I will often ask, say, a group of men or men and women, like, can you imagine if you had a significant rite of passage that really welcomed you into the feminine or the masculine. And there were women, perhaps your mother, other women who were sharing their experience or men, your father, you know, would it have changed your life? Wow. And if, if so, raise your hand. And usually everybody in the room raises their hand because we're so left so unprepared. Hmm. You know, I, I know much for myself, I've, a lot of this journey, I think that I've been on, ha, would have been easier. I don't regret anything, but of course, um, of course to the, the lack of a rite of passage into mm. what does it mean to be a man and welcomed by a group of embodied present men would have made an impact on my soul in some way that, that I would not have forgotten and would have saved me, I'm sure, quite a lot of <laughs> trouble and suffering. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with this. Um, I, the way I view it right now, and I, was, I had the, um, the opportunity to travel with my brother on a train maybe a couple of weeks ago, well, we talked a little bit about that. He seems to be on the opposite, on the flip side of, you know, I'm good. I don't need any of this work. And, um, you know, I don't get along with, with our dad and that's okay. And I think he's slowly starting to open up. I realized it's really uh, the qualities of, I mean, the qualities of the man is really to uh, make a difference with his deeds and his own actions and rather verbally trying to persuade, uh, persuade someone. Absolutely. And more, more you become embodied in that way the more he would mm -hmm. be come interested but trying to argue somebody mm -hmm. to do it when they have a fixed position yeah it just doesn't work it's a recipe it for work. Work. and yeah. then who am i to tell you and all that stuff comes in but yes i can be clear and i can tell the truth mm. even if it's awkward socially sometimes because people judge it yeah, of course. You no, know, there are situations where I still sometimes get uncomfortable in social circumstances to tell my story about, because I've led a very unusual life, you know, mm. in <laughs> India, doing wow. all these things that I've done over these years. And sometimes I feel like, oh God, I don't want this. To come. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I mean, for, for, for India, I've watched the, the Netflix series Wild Wild Country uh, about Osho's life. Um, yeah. And I, I, I don't think I can even imagine what was that been like. But from, you know, he went to the US, um, everything that actually, you know, maybe a, a little bit of a segue into that. What, what did you thought about that movie if you have seen it? And was it really uh, kind of portrayed objectively, so to speak? You know what? I only watched two, two more, okay. two of, of them, and I felt like it was. There were some parts that felt really good and right, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's a great story. Mm. But I would certainly tell it differently, and my experience was different than what was being shown. Mm. And I think there was a certain bias in the whole thing. And and yet on the other hand. I think Osher probably would have loved it because 
he liked the controversy. Yeah. But yeah. he did what he did he said, you love me or hate me, but what I can't stand is indifference. Mm. <laughs> Okay. So he, he, he wasn't somebody to avoid controversy, but it was a very, very precious time in my life. Um, one of the best times of my life, wow. even though there was a lot of things that were going on in the community that um, I had some awareness of and some capacity to just avoid noticing because the basic energy of all of us who were there together mm. in this deep love and in this powerful aliveness that we were creating a city out of a <laughs> desert, you know, it was, uh, it was great. Yeah. I can wow. just say it was great. And a lot of, there were, there were things that happened there that weren't great. And mm -hmm. there's still questions for me about some of those things. I can't say that I've got everything sorted, but it didn't, um, it didn't take away my respect and love for our show mm -hmm. in any way. And I know things, maybe I'll write a book one day because I, I know things that I don't think have become public yet. So mm -hmm. let's see. Of course, of course, everything in, in due course. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be on the uh, watch out for that book. Oh, sure. uh, I'll let you know. We do another interview if it starts to take. Yes, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, to, to to kind of uh, come back to to the conversation before this the segue. Um, what what do you think about the state of you could say masculinity today? Um, What's been your observation? I know you more right now, correct me if I'm wrong, you're leading more uh, work with regards to re relationships, not so much men's work. I think you've kind of uh, moved away a little bit from that, although I'm, I'm sure it's quite um, present still in, in, the, in the work that you're doing today. What do you think of masculinity today? Um, men, what, what are they missing, I guess, um, yeah, if, if they want to start a, a journey or, or their own personal journey in inquiry of all the things that we've been discussing for the last 40 minutes or so, um, yeah, where would you tell them to, to start perhaps? I would tell men in general that the chances are very, very high that you need to, you, you would benefit in the quality of your life and your relationships your sense of purpose and mm. your ability to manifest yourself in the world if you would do some men's work and find a men's group and just open yourself up in that environment and see what comes up because of all the things that we've talked about, about how we were conditioned. And as well as this notion and this word that's going, this phrase that's being used, toxic masculinity there's truth in it there's all, as far as i can see and if you just watch what's happening in america right now in the politics it's like on full display mm -hmm. you know a, a real kind of penultimate version of toxic masculinity being mm -hmm. um, performed by um, mr trump mm -hmm. you want to call him president um, <laughs> he's a very polarizing figure, that's for sure. He's a very polarizing figure, and mm -hmm. he's, and I think he's very toxic and uh, very unaware mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even mentally ill. Um, but I think, and I, women are sending me sometimes their sons for sessions who are around the age of 20, 21, 22, 19, because they have received this phrase, toxic masculinity inside, mm. and they can identify that they have some amount of that and they go into an avoidant behavior in trying to appear or show their masculinity or find confidence in it, or they go into depression, or they just go into smoking massive amounts of weed to just space it out um, and I've had really some great 
talks and sessions with young men um, who are suffering from that. And masculinity in itself is not toxic. The behavior of a tremendous amount of men reflects uh, a toxic masculinity that is part of the culture and is part of history and that but it, it needs to be healed by authenticity and authentic masculine men. And we need them in leadership. We need them in, in business. We need them in um, politics. We need them in as everywhere as partners to women who are doing authentic work on themselves to really be able to meet the feminine, you know, and it, and it's happening. I would say it's happening. There's a lot of interest, you know, young men like yourself and others are coming to these groups and they're, they're looking into these things and then they're going about trying to share what they're discovering with a passion. And yet sometimes if you look on a big scale, it's not representing a real large part of the population you know, are really interested in, let's call it, for, for, rather than say awaken or um, transform, I recently started using a phrase called the joy of self-discovery because it's kind of positively oriented. How joyful and beautiful it is to, to start mm -hmm. discovering who am I underneath this mask and underneath these habits and underneath mm. these self images and beliefs? It's a joy. And the problem with transformation and awakening is awakening implies you're asleep and transforming implies that you're wrong. And a lot of men resist those things. Mm. They just don't want to go in and do that. And so, but, but my experience with with inner work is that it's joyful. Yes, I face painful things, but I face painful things anyway, you know, but mm. then it, it's joyful to discover who you are. And that is the process of waking up. So, you know, the more people like yourself can bring your enthusiasm, especially young men right now coming through and, and, doing this kind of work and organizing groups and participating in it, sharing, mm. you know, the, the better it will be. So I can't make big generalizations. I can say, um, I don't know what percentage of the population is really learning from the past <laughs> or is just perpetuating it. You know, I would like to believe in a kind of that there is a dialectic process where a synthesis comes out instead of all this extreme polarity that we see right now. There are some people that wake up and they listen to both sides and they and 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 they offer something new. You know, I feel like something new is needed, and they're still really like old school, old world patriarchal institutions and power structures in place that I think are toxic. Mm, mm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not to say, you know, it's not to say that um, there isn't a lot of toxic women out there. It's a whole nother story. Mm. You know, it's not yeah. just like, you know, they've got their shit together and the men don't. It's a, it's a journey for both. A collective uh, one, yeah. Yeah, and to come into um, balance where you're, in, you're grounded and confident in your masculinity or your femininity and you're integrating the other side so that you have a, a wholeness. And then the, the creativity that can be generated by people who have that and the possibilities for new answers and new ways to live and be and relate are immense. And 
some people have to, you know, deal with their frustration in ways other than just blaming. Oh yeah, that being being a victim is probably the easiest thing, right? There is no personal responsibility. It's always someone else. It's no, it's you know, it's never me. Uh, so yeah, that's probably the easiest easiest thing to do. Yeah, and that's the and that's a big problem right now. Is you know, the and has always been, I think, is the victim yeah. identity and mentality. Hmm. You know, uh, speaking about men's work, I um, I spoke with one of the other facilitators that I've interviewed. Um, he's uh, kind of his, I wouldn't say prediction, but the, the way he sees things is that in 10, 10 years, perhaps, men's work is going to be a little bit more mainstream because the cycle of fatherless boys or boys growing up in a household without a father or the father maybe being there but not being actually present is just perpetuating and you know becoming more and more obvious um what, what do you think do you think uh, let me just phrase the, the question this way do you think uh, men's work is going to become a little bit more mainstream in the next five to ten years to come given where we are right now as a culture as a society particularly the, you know the western world do you think it's going to become a lot more popular i hope so that's about as far mm. as i can go Mm. Mm. Um, I really hope so, and I and I pray for it, and I wish it, and I would do what I can to support it and encourage it, and get men to enter into those environments that are challenging, that make them mm -hmm. feel insecure, but that also, by their very nature, are so enriching. And I, I really hope that and it's so, I don't have clear predictions right now for where the world's going. It's too much in a, it's just too liminal still. It's just mm -hmm. too unknown, you know. But one thing that I can see is in my own life personally and in generally is that the momentum, the tremendous force of momentum from the past, if it, if not stopped, is at least paused, is impeded, is slowed down, is not so much certain to keep recreating itself in all the old patterns. And in that, I'm hoping some new intelligence will awaken just by, by the fact of what we've all been through in the last year, you know, just in self-reflection and the obvious need to make some changes, you know. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. um, sustainability of the planet, another mm -hmm. really huge thing. If you start to really even get into that and recognize what's happening, it opens a lot of other questions mm, mm. to be resolved. And, and I think, I don't think that nature is going to let up with the, the direction that things are going in right now until we really make some big changes and to make those mm changes we have to change yeah so you know it's like it's and it's so strong in our face right now yeah. what's happening and there's so much evidence <laughs> you know i i just watched the latest movie of david attenborough and i really highly recommend it it's really mm. good and it has a hopeful ending mm. it's not mm. just one of those ones where you go away and you feel like oh no it's more bitten yeah Mm. That's so <laughs> I um it's an interesting it's an interesting thing I definitely do believe that we as a species we have to do something radical if we are to alter the the course of or the trajectory rather of where things are headed to right now um but you know given what hap what has happened this year specifically 2020 with this whole you know pandemic which I'm not going to get into uh, my initial thoughts, and I'm actually curious to know your thoughts as well, not to get into polit the politics or conspiracy theories or anything like that. Um, I, I see that this whole set of 
rules and uh, we're doing it kind of for your safety. It seems to be maybe, um, well, maybe castrating is probably a little bit of a too strong word, but masculinity is being a little bit taken away in this new world order, new era with so many legislations and uh, so many rules to follow. And don't get me wrong, I do wholeheartedly believe there is a space and need for that. But to the point where government is dictating almost every single move here is a little bit castrating men, I think. Um, is that your, uh, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts, whether it's with in support of this or maybe on the opposite side. Um, do you think that this is benefiting men current, you know, what's happening right now, or maybe you don't have any thoughts on that? Um, what's, what's I don't really have any it? thoughts in the way you're presenting it. I don't experience mm. it as castrating. I, I experience the precautions that are put into place and the restrictions as rather necessary because every time somebody mm. doesn't do them, the the spike in the infections goes up and america is the greatest example of it it's like they're probably mm. hit half a million deaths really soon so there is a necessity and i don't think there's been particularly great leadership it was slow you mm. know and then had to probably overreact in some ways i don't enjoy it i i really long for this whole thing to be over even though it has slowed me down it's relaxed my nervous system in some ways it's mm. brought me out of some routines that i had for many years so the, the liminal space of not knowing has served me in that sense that i can hang in that not knowing space right now a bit better castrated i don't know you know i think the forces that want to drive forward to keep the economy running and everything are i don't i'm not real trust trusting in the decisions that those people will make either so i i just don't know i really don't know mm. right now i feel like observing the the regulations and hope that we within the next five or six months see uh, some rapid change and hopefully mm. are able to start to move and that people come out of that with with a new mindset rather than mm. the old greedy mindset that, that just pushes even harder to i don't know get your way or destroy or whatever mm. so castrated mm -hmm. i don't know i never thought of it that way no and i didn't feel it that way i feel frustrated mm -hmm. at times mm -hmm. because i just want to i want to move <laughs> yeah well, my, energy is, me about it. my energy wants to move you know and so it's like yeah but I, I i work out a lot more inside my house than I yeah <laughs> i have to move it to so <laughs> It, it's a matter of perspective, like you, you're going through all these kind of, let's say, maybe not optimal times, or maybe there's some negativity and uncertainty there, but you're making the best out of it, right? That you're not, you know, being a victim and, you know, blaming people, etc. So you're just doing whatever it was in, in your control. You're taking ownership, responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like I, what you I, said about limit. Yeah, go ahead. No, no just like you're saying, and, and I don't want to be irresponsible in it and be mm. an agent of of infecting other people so i play mm -hmm. pretty conservative mm -hmm. in that way right now mm. I'm, I'm you know i'm yeah. not in a rebellious stage about it understood understood you think i'm very mature perspective there <laughs> <laughs> and i really like what you <laughs> it's a difference in the color of my hair probably <laughs> you know, okay <laughs> <laughs> I might have just said, fuck that, you know, <laughs> but, but right now I'm more like, okay, let's just see this thing through. Understood, understood. I, um, you know, I really like what you said about liminality and the fact that 
we are probably as a species are going through a very liminal space right now. Not, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. So I'm, I'm really curious as to how we react to this whole situation right now that's, you know, uh, revolving right now in front of our eyes. So let's see. I'm also curious as well. Yeah. I think curiosity is a very, very important quality to develop, not just as an intellectual concept, but as a, um, the key to self-reflection and inquiry, to be always mm. curious about yourself and anything you have a strong reaction to. You know, I try and always, I mean, I do react to things and I act out and stuff happens, but- So does everybody else. I try to catch the point of like, well, what is my reaction really about? What does that really say about me? Where is it going? To, and, and once I really become curious, then the object of what I'm reacting to tends to go fade away a little bit and that energy turns in. And mm. out of that, I can make real self-discoveries where I can't when I'm in that reactive place, because essentially that reactive place is a victim place, you know, mm. and I am responsible for my own reactions. It's about me, you know, and I may not be aware of what it is inside me that's reacting. It might still be part of my shadow, but it's an opportunity to see it and to integrate it and to evolve as a being. So curiosity is a really, really important word to me right now. I think that that's probably one of the words that's really just uh, I'd use for myself if people could describe me as just being curious exactly for those reasons. Um, I had a conversation today with my brother and, you know, I, I noticed he reacted very sharply about something. And I was like, mm, okay, so that's kind of the, the shadow. So I'm just throwing it in there and, People are, what are you talking about, shadow? And then like, we kind of started a little bit, oh, you're curious about this? You want to know a little bit more? And we kind of went on a little bit of a journey of me explaining what it is and demonstrating it and giving some examples. So, yeah, it uh, <laughs> really is a great, mm, mm, really yeah. is a great quality to have. Um, Rafi, right now, like you said, you, you've moved away from men's work and you're more doing um, relationship uh, working with couples or relationship work is, is that accurate or I think the main work I'm doing right now revolves around a, a, a group called the path of love and mm. that is um, under the title of path retreats and that's a very very intensive seven-day process of going in and really looking at yourself and bringing whatever's in there out in the open. And it's, uh, I've, I've never seen or come across any work that so powerfully impacts people on a personal level. So, and that I've been leading for the last over 20 years. And then out of wow. that, I've created a group with, together with a partner of mine, Cheria Hanover, where we lead um, something called working with people trainings. Um, and we, we're teaching people how to be counselors and how to work with people, how, how to be therapists, how to, and we take people through a six part process every year, not this year mm. so much, but, um, and, and those are the places that kind of represent the, um, the, the fullness and the integration of all the work that I've done in the past. So in the path of love, men's work's happening, women's work's happening, relationship work's happening, gender identification work is happening, mm. family history stuff is happening. You know, it's like everything goes in that group. And it's just amazing how much people are willing to bring forward. And it's a lot about exposure. You know, exposing mm. what really needs to come out in the open. And that opens up a, a field of trust and love that takes people really, really deep. And we have a kind of equal number of staff to participants. 
So it really, mm. and theft does a parallel process. So it's, it's powerful work. And that takes up a lot of my schedule. Um, I'm kind of head of the organization and just the endless planning and stuff that goes with that whole thing. But the working with people, sure. um, trainings I'm really into also. And as well, I lead some men, women relationship groups I do. Uh, um, but that's usually part of um, something that's a bigger organization. Like I lead it in Sweden mm -hmm. and, I, and I lead sometimes with Rebel Wisdom and I come mm. into events groups. Um, I still love it. It's, it's not that I've lost my passion for it. It's just like in this talk, talking to you, I'm sure we could go on for hours and, yes. and yes. Keep, keep digging into these issues and stuff. But, um, mm. Mm. and I mean, I'm very interested in the male-female connection and dealing with some of the, some of the woundedness that women and men each bring to the relationship process and helping support them with some things that help clear away some of the clouds of the past and to actually be able to see and recognize each other. Relationships are a difficult thing. I've recently gone into a relationship. So man, yeah, that in and of itself is probably, I don't know, another two, three hour conversation just to kind of begin to scratch the surface of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, one, actually one last question. Um, how did you have any mentors? And I know that there is a, you know, especially coming back to child, uh, children or boys being brought up without a father figure and the need for an elderly matured masculine figure there. A, did you have any mentors and also B, could you, talk a little bit about that importance of having a, a mentor, uh, a, a male, a man, a mentor in your life as a, as a boy? Well, in one way, I feel very fortunate in my relationship with my father. There were many aspects where it was deficient and, and causing me to have suffering and anxiety and a feeling of lostness and lack of purpose and in other ways he really showed up for me and he was really there and we did share a lot and there was a feeling of having a father there um, who introduced me to a lot of things that are kind of typically male we were in nature a lot and we were doing a lot of things like that mm -hmm. however when i got into my into university i had a feeling that Nobody had ever really seen me and really understood me and really been able to give me guidance and direction and help me see really what are my skills and what, and what are my deficiencies? Where might I really want to put my energy? And so I ended up, you know, going to university and, and feeling like I was still a kid. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, so mentors are great. I I've had many, over the years who were therapists who were group leaders i've had osho i had you know tremendous tremendous support through my life um uh, from male figures who hit me hard sometimes and um and picked me up with love and showed me things and so in that way i've been very fortunate but I also have been courageous and, you know, in, mm. in seeking them and going after it and putting my time in and, and going to them and asking, you know, and, and doing the work, you know? So it, it, of course it accelerates the program, your progress, your self-development to have somebody there who knows the territory not just theoretically, but has actually walked it. And they've got their own scars and wounds and, and learning curve that they went on that, that has 
become wise and, and, and they can transmit something. And that transmission can help so much. You know, it can, it can quicken that understanding. So mentors are very, very helpful. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And so that, 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 that was a great answer. <laughs> Right. Uh, I'm also conscious of time. Uh, you've been incredibly, uh, very generous with, with your time uh, today. Any, any final thoughts, anything uh, that you'd like to add? Um, also, where can actually people find a little bit more about you, the retreats and the courses that you're uh, running right now? Well, you can go to pathretreats.com and you can go to working with people trainings dot com and that represents quite a lot of my work if you want to do couples work i do something uh, holiday retreat in greece and one in costa rica every year for couples man woman couples with um, david pramal and me ten who and we call them tantra mantra and it's a combination of singing and i give tantric exercises and they're 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 wonderful groups and a lot of fun. And for a lot of people who haven't done um, a lot of work, it's kind of a, a good starting place. Um, mm. And as well, Rafi and Morgan, you can look me up. I've done a lot of talks and things come up on mm -hmm. the internet. And I yes. want to thank you very much, Pavel, and, and support you in what you're trying to do. And um, Mm. I've enjoyed this last hour very much, and I feel your thank you very. Much. I feel your heartfulness, your intelligence, your enthusiasm, and I know that passion is going to take you in a very, very interesting journey. So I give you my my support and my love. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very That's much. My, the light in me honors the light in you as well. <laughs> well All right. <laughs> okay. All right, I, got, folks, I have a session uh, in a few minutes, so I'm going to have to okay, check Okay, I'll out. leave you to it then. Thank you very much for joining in, folks. I'll see you later.